Hello. Aloha. So good to see you. Wow. Yay. Well, we all made it through another week. <laughs> I got to see a few people yesterday and in, in person at a day long we had here in Kohala. It was really sweet. Some folks actually who had only seen online, you know, in Kona and Puna, but they came out. So it was really, really nice and nice to be back online. Well, take the take your time to see everybody if you haven't yet. Just So as we allow this stream of silent awareness to come over our body and our senses, is there any area of the body where you feel predominant sensations, subtle sensations, sensations calling for attention. Sweep of sensitivity, brush strokes of pressure, points of sensation. Patches of pressure, lightness, tingling. And then if you shut your eyes, do you notice the visual light stream continuing with points of light? like a starry night are moving from shadow to light to a mixture.
and the awareness with knowledge that even the eyes close, visual experience can occur. Like the sensitivity of the eye may still be stimulated by internal physicality. The external physicality is with light waves, light particles, light and shadow, color and form. So it's a little different and different stimulus. We have the inner vision, inner sights. It helps make dream states more comprehensible. But likewise, we can have inner sounds, not from the air element and earth element together, striking the ear sensitivity. But other systems of the body, chemistry, blood flow, being proximate cause for inner hearing. I'm just beginning to see where in the body is settling when attention settles there, abides, noticing a particular area of body or breath that feels present, constant. But more or less continuing arising and falling in a way sensations. One of the reasons why the breath is a useful home anchor is the consistency of the in and out breath producing myriad sensations of all the elements. Each breath, a different configuration, a different symphony of sensation. The interest keeps awareness and the potential of insight, knowledge, awake, interested. The feeling of the sensations occurring with the rise and fall, the abdomen, the expansion and contraction, from within the breathing process, within the abdomen, within the chest, until there's no longer any sense of anyone breathing. It's just the experience of the breath breathing itself.
showing us the natural functions of the body and mind. Remembering how sometimes we advise if you're observing the abdominal area, expand and relax, or rise and fall. There's a bit of a longer gap or space between the out breath and in breath the falling and the rising, the relaxing and the propelling filling of the abdomen. And in that gap, usually more quickly than we notice, the mind will go off into the thought realm thinking about something so entirely different or commenting on what we think is happening, thoughts about experience, until we make that commentary or thinking process the focus of the silent awareness. And then it just subsides by itself or grows into the background. And in playing with the alternation now and again of what can be a calming, soothing effect of just being with the breath itself exclusively for some time. At other times, just to determine to have a, a sixth sense door awareness with the resolve to, for awareness to touch real things. The real things means sound vibration, not the bird or sound of a voice or a car. The reality is those elemental natures, earth, water, fire, air, momentarily appearing and the mindfulness and concentration are steady and consistent. It can, it can stay with those realities rather than proliferate into thoughts about the experience, what the sound is, where it's coming from. It actually can stay right with the sound as it is. And then even notice if it leaps for a moment into that, into that mental fabrication. And then notice that before we're drawn and identified into the narrative. Oh, interesting. Just thinking. His thoughts about sound, the sensation, the meditation, and growing our skill 
growing our nuanced awareness on how very refined and quick the heart mind conjures up the shadows of experience. And we notice those fabricating shadows. And then when we touch the, when awareness touches experience again, there's this strong felt sense of presence, present time, present time awareness, anchored in the present, abiding in the present. And that's a safe, secure feeling normally from that place of abiding in the present. Anything can occur and the wisdom awareness is attuned to see the realities of appearing and disappearing, of insecurity, of phenomena, of whatever arises and passes. And actually is is comforted in the truth that there's no agency, no controllability. As we feel the mind loosen its tendencies to grasp, to cling, to conjure to make things happen or make things not happen. See for yourself.
Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for the great instructions. I think sometimes um, we can't maybe appreciate or emphasize enough um, the power of, of sitting together and, and especially uh, over time together. Um, I'm not intending to really talk about that today, but just to appreciate it again that um, how important that aspect of coming together is. It's so rare, rare to be human and to be with other humans and to value and to really value silence and what we, what we go through together to like to be held in that and to know how important it is. I wanted to begin by talking about um, what a gift and privilege it is to live on, on the big island of Hawaii. Um, I'm not sure exactly when I was invited over here to teach uh, a day long, and I remember landing from Honolulu to this island and being driven up the highway and just seeing these vast, um, vast fields of lava, just black, just vast lava. And um, it felt like it stopped my mind. You know, there was something that is inexpressible to me about that, but that um, to be so close to the core of the earth, to be so close to the lava, uh, And that to have a sense that here the goddess of the volcano Pele is so revered by so many people, like uh, particularly, of course, a lot of the Hawaiian people, um, and that that this live on an island where there are two active volcanoes. Oh, somebody's saying there's no sound. Is it? No, it's okay. Okay, thanks. Um, there, there is, you can have kind of a very rich uh, appreciation of the paradox of creation and destruction and creation and destruction that you're so close to it. It, it kind of can't really, um, it's so easy to drop into a non-conceptual understanding of it because it's so powerful. Um, you really do feel part of the stars and the sun and the moon. It, it's like, it's so, you're so close to this um, life and death. And one of the things I wanted to talk about in terms of paradox is that there's a um, Actually, quite a few areas you can go, but there's a particular place on Mauna Loa is considered the largest mountain in the world. And there are vast old, old lava fields and new ones. And um, what's amazing is that there's a there's a two kinds of um, lava that are talked about, Pohoihoi and A'a. And the Pohoihoi is smooth. And um, especially when it's hardened and older, you can just walk on it and walk on it. If it's new, you can fall through, you can fall through in it, so you have to be careful on it in that way. But but it's just um, extraordinary. This again, this smoothness, but very close to it. And often there are many um, fields of the ah. Uh -uh. It's the opposite. It's so rough and it's so it it can cut your shoe like in a second it can it's just um and it looks often like castles of roughness and danger compared to this very smooth 
Pohoi hoi. And even the words, you know, pohoi hoi, right? It sounds so inviting. And ah, uh, ah, uh, it's like walking on it. Ah, ah, it, it's really it's painful. Um, and I think that it's such a great uh, metaphor for life, you know, just the, the within this birth of the land, you know, the, the, and the, the power of it, that you could have this smoothness and roughness, even within that, that it, um, that, that nature has this capacity to bring us so much joy and so much sorrow. You know, so much life and death. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes um, when I wake up in the morning, I don't actually often look in the mirror, but this morning I did. <laughs> and um, I saw so many wrinkles like on my face, like that I hadn't seen before. Not that, you know, I just haven't taken a good look for a while. And I happen to get wrinkles on my face quite young comparatively to other people, but I didn't get gray hair. Um, as quickly as most people. So I had that sense that, okay, we get, we get our lot, you know, and, um, but I think there was hidden to me uh, this kind of delusion about getting older, coming into my 70s. I think I had an idea that somehow the amount of wrinkles I had was going to stay the same <laughs> and that the gray wasn't going to come. Like, I think I just said, okay, this is, my old age and this is it and this morning I I took a look and then I took a better look and I'm like wow like wow okay 70s it's really changing <laughs> I'm getting more wrinkles than ever and more gray hairs and um, so there was that but then I thought of the um, elections coming up and I thought it was very similar like this kind of kind of like there's a certain level of delusion that it's good to live with, <laughs> cope with um, whatever happens, right? But it's like, um, you know, I think even if things go really well, it's going to be <laughs> rough, right? Like, you know, you can't second guess it, but I think that um, it's it's how it is getting old, but it's also the time we're living in. Uh, so I think that this doesn't mean that we don't make effort to make the world and our lives um, as better a place as we can, inwardly and outwardly. That that and to that this is the time to, of course warn us all that this teaching is so much about knowing what's right to make effort for that it, it's like no matter how hard um or, and that it's the attachment to the result of our effort is where we will suffer that it's not that the, the goodness of the effort and whatever endeavor we make in life to be Mind and to be free and et cetera, et cetera, all the spiritual values. So I think the reminder, of course, of us all is that the idea is that we um, grow spiritually to be stronger and more protected and to know what we're doing here, no matter what happens or unfolds. This is from um, Barry Lopez, the great a uh, writer, contemporary writer of our time, but he died in 2020. He wrote a book of essays toward the end of his life, and it was called um, Embrace Fearlessly the Burning World. He said, to read the newspapers today, to merely answer the phone is to know the world is in flames. The central project of my adult life as a writer is to know and to love what we have been given and to urge others to do the same. 
it's like we might all have a different version of what we're doing here, right? But to, to have that sense, you know, that to know and love what we've been given, no matter what, again, is so important and to urge others to do the same. And so, uh, Kuan Yin, the great goddess of compassion. There's a um, quotation uh, that is applied to her, the Bodhisattva of compassion, that the winds of circumstance blow across emptiness. Whom can we harm? Whom can they harm? The winds of circumstance blow across emptiness. Whom can they harm? Ah, right? The winds of circumstance. And the winds of circumstance, it's like to really get on this deep level that we're all here together on the planet, that it's a certain kind of karma for us all to be here. And that includes all beings, not just human beings. It includes the stars, it includes the sun, it includes clouds, it includes ants, it includes all, all of it, all of us. And, and really to be able to, I think at times, really uh, go deep enough to access that depth of understanding that we are all living out Kama together so that in the context of the times we're in, that to really um, appreciate that we can strengthen our compassion, that this is a time, to, what better time this week than to strengthen our compassion? But not, you just don't, not include yourself, right? It's including caring about your own pain, but caring about everybody's pain, all, all of us not just the ones we like. And the equanimity, you know, the, that deeper peace with things as they are, it doesn't mean we don't try to change things and try to bring goodness into the world in whatever way we do. That's not what it means. This, but this genuine understanding that things are as they are. In a um, book of poetry some years ago, some years ago now, uh, I think it was uh, called, it was Adrian Rich, and it was called A Wild Patience Has Taken Me This Far. A Wild Patience Has Gotten Me This Far, Taken Me This Far. And in it, um, part of the uh, one poem, she quotes George Jackson, from the soul dead, but brothers. And in prison, uh, this is what he wrote. The, the significant feature of the desperate man reveals itself when he meets other desperate men directly or vicariously, and he experiences his first kindness. Someone to strain with him, to strain to see him as he strains to see himself. Someone to understand. Someone to accept the regard, the love that desperation forces into hiding. Those feelings that find no expression in desperate times store themselves up in great abundance, ripen, strengthen, and strain the walls of their repository to the utmost. Where the kindred spirit touches this wall, it crumbles. No one responds to kindness. No one is more sensitive to it than the desperate man. The 
the meaning of this is so critical for us to know that if we're kind in any way to anyone who needs that kindness, how critical it is, but to especially someone who's really desperate for it, right? But all of us respond to kindness. No one responds to kindness. No one is more sensitive to it than the desperate man. There's never going to be a time where we can't do something to be helpful in any day in this world. I mentioned this in a talk, I think maybe it's a few months ago now, but it, it, it's, it's um, maybe someday I'll try to write more about this, but it, uh, there was a movie everywhere, everything everywhere all at once. And there's a character, uh, male husband in this movie that um, his wife considers to be too weak and too meek. And in the movie, as it unfolds, she becomes more and more uh, assertive. And, um, and at a, a certain point, it's a very complicated movie. I, I can't go into that part of it, but it's at a certain point, he says to her at the, toward the end, you think because I'm kind that it means I'm naive and maybe I am, but it's strategic and necessary. This is how I fight. And I thought, when I heard that, I just thought it was such a beautiful description of a way to appreciate kindness. Not that we have to necessarily relate to it like fighting, but it's a good reminder of its of kindness's power, its protective power. Fighting with our goodness, fighting with our kindness, that that it, it it's vulnerable, but kind and goodness is is so important on the planet. Again, without the the attachment to the result of it. The protective nature of the Brahma Viharas, I think we all, for over these years, have just grown into appreciating how critical it is that, that without that softness of heart, that the walls that, that, that George Jackson is talking about, the walls that build up, um, that we can't have insight, we can't be with things as they are without the softness of heart to be with things as they are. I had a, a phone call with my older sister yesterday. And for her, the world is becoming so unbearable. And um, so I try to reassure her in different ways um, without mentioning Buddhism per se, uh, and I was, she was kind of upset with humans in general. And, you know, like when somebody's upset with humans in general, it's a great moment, at least for me, because I'll be like, great. Yeah, it's like, you know, well, I can mention it here. Well, the Buddha actually described 31 realms of existence possible in samsara to be born into, right? Like that there's 31. And that um, the bottom is hell, the next is hungry ghosts, the third is animals. And then guess where we are? We're fourth from the bottom. We're humans out of 31 realms of existence, we're fourth from the bottom. And I find great comfort in that because I feel like it explains a lot. Like it just like, just to, if you just kind of just take it in as a possibility. You know, that like, oh, because if you look around and you're surprised at how undeveloped a lot of humans are, then it this takes away the surprise. 
or the expectation and also the motivation. So the Buddha also taught, which I think is the most critical, that the human world is the best place to, to develop spiritually. So on the other hand, that it's most humans aren't as developed, but that a lot, there are plenty of humans, you know, the, the Buddha saw like there were some humans he didn't want to teach. He didn't feel like humans could understand what he wanted to share about getting free, but that there was some humans with just a little dust in their eyes, right? That, but that he said that it's because there's some pain and some pleasure, right? There's enough of the mix of pain and pleasure that humans are motivated, that they can get free. It's a great place to practice. What better place to develop compassion? And when you consider, um, I think that multi dimensions, the different ways we can talk about it, another way we can talk about it is just multi, we, we live in a much multi dimensional reality. And so if you look at like the thought stream in a human world, in all of our human world, if we just had a, a, an ability to listen to all the human beings' thoughts, right? If we could hear them for the next five minutes, it would be really painful. If you just put all of our thoughts that are sitting here today at the sitting, if we put them on a microphone, it would be overwhelming, right? And so that's a, that it's interesting to see, like, there are th sometimes when I just look at us humans, and there's this fathom long body that the Buddha talked about, there's this vast sky, we all share this amazing sky, no matter where we live on the planet. Like this, just the sky, never mind the stars or the trees or the earth. It's like this vastness. And then there's this little, <laughs> there's this little thin stream of thinking going on in all of us. But if you just think of yourself, like, who am I, right? Are we our thoughts? Well, hopefully not, right? Hopefully. But if, if you look at them as if we're believing our thoughts, and we're identified with them, they get so loud, right? It's like we're upset about something, we want something, it's like a ver when the thoughts are motivated by greed, hatred, and delusion, they're so painful. When you have a sense that it's my thinking, my thought, it's so painful. But if we have the sense that it's just this little stream, a thin line going through, um, and you listen to it in a different way, that it's just sound. It's just the sound of your voice. It's not your, they're not your thoughts. If they're our thoughts, we could control them. They come so fast, we can't even begin to control them. And so here's this, like this little teeny tiny stream of thought in this vastness of space, vastness of our bodies. And do we wanna get a big enough perspective where they can actually seem more distant and that it gets more quiet. It's, it's possible for us. We all know this. And, and it's like that, that instruction Steve got, gave about how we can be aware of sound. Like that silent awareness he started with and that like the receiving of sound is texture vibration, not, not the kind of word, the concept bird or the concept car, that that isn't what we're hearing. It's the same with thought. If you pay attention to it, whether it's usually it's a, um, a visual image or it's the sound of your voice or somebody else's voice. So it takes that balance of, of real um, getting still enough and quiet enough to really want to understand, well, what is thought free from any memory of it? And what would be the experience of 
being with hearing, like non-conceptual hearing or non-conceptual seeing, non-conceptual experience of our body, well, there's non-conceptual experience of thinking. It can just flow by, but where it's not mine, and it's just like a, a, it's just sounds or just images, and the images are from the past. They're not in the present. They're in the present appearing, but they're memory. So when our thoughts get insistent, when they get loud, that's a great time to investigate what's really going on. Because often we're not actually paying attention to what's underneath what's happening. Often there's an emotion we're not wanting to be with or aversion or attachment. And it's like actually our whole being is trying to get our attention. All it is when they get loud and assistant, they're just trying to get our attention to pay attention to what really needs attending to. Meaning we're missing, we're missing what we're really needing to be attending to. A great example would be fear, right? We might have this whole thought stream about moving to another country <laughs> recently, or, you know, who knows? But it's like, it could be that that's a reaction to what's happening and it's so unpleasant. And then it's like that could get louder and louder. Oh, maybe we start looking up New Zealand or, you know, like whatever the usual places. And, um, but actually it could be that we could see that maybe we could attend to that there's fear. And if we connect with the fear, that those thoughts will disappear. Or if they come, there'll be a wise discernment of them, right? Not a, uh, just a blind reaction, knee-jerk reaction. So there's choice, right? There's always, with mindfulness, there's always that choice. And metta and the Brahma Viharas is the choice of um, how we're gonna respond to what's appearing versus be oppressed and have the knee-jerk reaction to what's appearing. This is from uh, the poet Stonehouse. Uh, Zen monk. Reasoning comes to an end. A thought breaks in the middle. All day, nothing but time. The whole year undisturbed. On a pristine mountain, clouds float free. In a clear sky, the moon is a lonesome O. Even if physical discipline worked, it wouldn't match knowing Zen. Reasoning comes to an end, a thought breaks in the middle. Ah. Free of believing the content of the thought. Room for deeper understanding, not through the thought process, right? We're going through that insight that doesn't happen by figuring things out. So the combination of the applying the Brahma Viharas or the, the mindfulness and all the factors of awakening, it, it allows for us to be connected to whatever is happening, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Um, we're connected, but we're protected. When my... Um, 
I think my freshman year in college, 69, was a kind of volatile time to be alive. Uh, and uh, things on my particular campus in Springfield College, Massachusetts, were very um, um, starting to go up in flames, as they say, very politically difficult. Um, a lot of professors quit as they couldn't handle how um, polarized the, the campus was getting. And um, the Black Panthers were um, helping some of the students, um, African-American students taking take over a dorm. And uh, I had a professor of botany that um, he cared so much. And he saw his professor friends that cared so much quit. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but he was a Quaker. He had had polio as a kid. So he had, uh, he was different, very caring being. Um, and I remember going to go to class and he had put a big sign on the door of his class where he said, uh, I have to go out to the woods today to be quiet and I'll be back tomorrow. And I, I can't tell you how tense and upset things were. And uh, I remember I decided I would wait there when he got to work the next day. I decided to see what it was like when he came back. And it was one of the most significant moments of my life. Like he was so peaceful and it wasn't like he avoided anything. He didn't ignore anything. He was more connected than ever to the pain that was going on, but he had come to peace with it. And it was so tangible. Uh, and I remember really making a, a resolve and aspired to understand that. To be so clear that that's who he was in the face of it. And so, of course, with the Nietzsche, Dukkha, Anatta, you know, there's a, if we really want to be connected with the truth of existence, we want to see where we're wanting things to be permanent that are impermanent. We're wanting to understand that things are unreliable, even though we're wanting them to be reliable. Yeah. We want to see where we're taking things personally, even though at times we want to be taking them personally. It's um, this way that we can, again, finding that strength and the protection of being connected to the truth. And knowing that that peace is, it's not just like peace is an individual experience. It's something that affects all beings everywhere. It affects one moment of truth. Peace affects the whole universe. I think sometimes um, we're at the time of um, the moon that it will be full the night of February 8th, um, Tuesday. And it's also uh, said to be 
uh, going, it's going to be a full eclipse that night. On the, it's rare for a full eclipse to happen on election night. But I, I wanted to mention that uh, something I've been noticing in the last year is how, um, not that I haven't noticed it before, but the um, metaphor for f awakening, for enlightenment, is often the full moon. And um, one of the things I've begun to appreciate is that when the moon is bright, it doesn't have to be full, but when the moon is out and it's bright enough, that's a lot of the time clouds come. Yeah, we don't always see the moon, but these clouds will come and cover it, but we can still see. It's not, it's not like it's all dark. In fact, it's usually only all dark when it's the new moon, when there's no moon, but also when there's clouds. It's like I lived off the grid for many years in northern Maine, and there were times when I used to have to crawl up this hill. <laughs> to get to my place because it would be so dark and the clouds were there in the new moon and I'd forget my flashlight and I couldn't look up and see even any light coming through the um, this break in the trees because of the road. Um, I think that um, that's actually rare. And it's like that with our attention, that it's not like an either or thing, awareness you know, or like a free awareness, a liberated awareness, a kind awareness, a kind liberated awareness, all these ways we might say it, the silent awareness, that actually we tend to have this idea that it's all or nothing. But actually, it's much more like a, a sky where the clouds are covering the moon, but the, the, there's, a, there's enough light to see. It's not dark. And I'm I think that it's very important for us to remember that maybe in the course of a, a day that we might want our attention to be more like at a peak experience of attention. But actually, there are many times where the attention might be good enough. And a lot of it is just over and over again. It's a question of heart. It's like when you find that you're getting caught or you find that you come to from being distracted, so much of it is just finding that place inside that wants to be attentive, that wants to care, right? That wants to be attentive. It's, it's not that big a peak experience it's actually can be very subtle a very subtle shift and it's something again i think to really cultivate and value and it's something just lastly i think um you can't make unconditional acceptance happen you can't make genuine equanimity happen but equanimity happen but sometimes for no it, it's not it's not an explicable reason it will appear something will just shift today i was so busy it was amazing so feeling so busy and um it has been for a while, and I have these three feral cats. They all are in kind of different areas of the outside world, but two of them were in a similar place. And I kind of looked out, was about to feed them, and um, they, they looked at me like pleading with me to stop, like pleading with me to just be with them a little bit. And I almost didn't do it. It was just like, oh. and. Um, there's that feeling that like, oh, I don't have time, but I managed to get myself out there and I just sat on the steps <laughs> and they were doing nothing, which they do a lot. Like they really do nothing a lot. Like it's so amazing to me. And um, I just hung out and it's been very, very hot. It's been very still for quite a long time here where I live. So we're just hanging out, and after about 10 minutes, we were so quiet, you could hear this very light breeze start. We could hear it, and you could feel the three of us just, it felt like the whole yard did this, but we just kind of got more attentive. 
uh, and this light breeze came and the leaves on the tree started to just move a little bit and the grass started to move a little bit. And we were all, it felt like this contentment happened. Not a, a buoyant happiness. It was a very quiet contentment and, and ease, but it was shared. And these, this kind of contentment is um, what often will appear out of um, not trying to make anything happen, being okay with whatever's happening, being okay with the pahoy hoy and the ah uh ah, -uh. and uh, so I'd like to just end with this. Anonymous poem from The Wine of Endless Life, translated by Jerome Seaton. The flower in the bin has gone stale. My ladle is broken. Even my old wooden bowl has a hair lip. Contented heart is my portion. It's sweeter than all the sweetmeats in the world. Contented heart is our portion. So if you have any questions for Stephen or I. The breeze didn't last long, by the way. <laughs> it was a real quick breeze. <laughs> Catalina, hello. Hello. Thank you for the beautiful talk today. It's so wonderful. And uh, I am an ignorant of all this <laughs> when you say that we are in the fourth, fourth right. level of existence. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Today. How? People want so much to stay here. I, I really don't, it doesn't fit in my mind that people want to stay in this realm. But anyway, my question is this, I have been hearing a lot about awakening, awakening, anyway. And, and I say, what are they talking about? You know, what is awakening? So what is that? Do I have it that anyone can have it? Could you have it for one minute only? Would you have to be awake all the time? So if you can talk about that, it would be very nice. Thank you. That's a great question. Stephen, <laughs> you want to start or do you want me to start? It's a good question because there's there are many 
words and terms um, for what a Dhamma path, uh, what it leads to. Uh, and just listening to your, your question, you, you have, you seem to have most of the answers. Because when we start paying attention and start uh, understanding the body-mind stream and um, how experience actually is, how it appears, rather than what we think about it, there are moments of seeing really clearly. Uh, so one, one way to describe our another term to the term of, of awakening is the meditation we're doing is vipassana, which means to, to see clearly, to see nature as it is. Uh, not what we think it is or not the conceptual term for our, our body and, and our experience and feelings and emotions, but just the the visceral connection with, uh, you know, like Michelle spoke about fear, and and um, one can be awakened or liberated or see clearly with a moment of fear. Generally, a moment of fear will come with a, a narrative, a story about ourselves are the object of our fear. But every once in a while, when we're paying attention to the moment, the fear is just seeing pasana, we pasana, the nature of fear is seen as it is, as it, as it has this effect on our consciousness. Maybe it tightens and darkens the mind and the body and maybe there's a, a sense of impending doom, something even worse than fear. But for a moment, the story drops away. And it's just, it's just the emotion of fear. And unconnected with the object of fear or being my fear, identifying with it. But just what does fear feel like? And we often encouraged to try and feel in the body where the sensations are that correlate with that fear. And first to feel the sensations because since body sensations are an easy place to see and be with things as they really are. After a while, the, the idea of shoulder or hand or head disappear and there's just, it, it, it's elemental nature, vibration, or heat or hardness or fluidity and so forth, pressure. Uh, but all, all of those qualities come along with emotions too uh, and f form, uh, form in the body a reflection of the emotion or the mind state. So, so that's one way to understand it. It's just a series of seeing things just as they are and outside of what the words, the terminology, the concepts that we've been taught, the naming of things, rather just the direct experience. That's a kind, that's an insight and a kind of uh, awakening step that leads to seeing things more and more clearly as they really are. A another word for awakening is is the end of the end of greed, hatred, and delusion, the end of suffering, extinction, you know, like Niroda and Nibbana are both words we hear in the Pali original that, that imply that the, the, the fire of our passion, lust, greed, attachment can be extinguished. 
and that the greed, hatred, delusion can be abandoned. So those are all ways to describe when you, other ways to describe when you hear the way, the word awakening. The, the Buddha often spoke about, um, you know, waking up from spiritual slumber in his own words, that ignorance is a kind of sleep. Uh, we're ignorant of the Four Noble Truths. We're ignorant of change, moment-to-moment -moment change, and the dukkha nature of that change, and the uncontrol uncontrollability of experience. We're ignorant of that until a moment when we're not, until a moment when the lights turn on and the room is illumined. But those are metaphors for suddenly seeing things as they are, for suddenly waking up from a spiritual slumber, the ignorance of how things are. All those are other ways of describing what that term might mean. Of course, it depends on how someone uses it, but we usually use it in this way as just another term or metaphor for being aware and seeing things as they really are. And seeing things as they really are, the mind loosens up its hold, its attachment on wanting things to be a certain way because we're clinging to experience, we're identified with it. We want to control things. So when we realize that moments come where it's just the free flow mind and sensations and emotions following their own nature, and there's no sense of clinging, grasping, identifying, self-referencing. That is a very spacious and liberating kind of moment. You could call that awakening. So in a way, um, we can live in many, many, many minutes of awakening uh, when you live um, honest and just um, without trying to force things or um, just being there. So in a, in, a, in, a, in a way, like all of us, we are awakened in, we are awakened many, many minutes. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think Steve said this already, but just to reinforce that we can keep deepening this quality of awareness, cultivating the awareness infused with wisdom. Um, you know, it's a, it can happen in one moment or it can happen over minutes. It can keep <coughs> happening. Um, so you're learning to access it more and more. Um, one thing that is happening to me is um, because I'm in, in a stage of very open my heart, um, I receive um, I receive um, the pain of others very um, strong. So kind of like a, um, there is no protection against things when I hear someone suffering, I kind of, I suffer. 
like them, you know. So sometimes I would prefer kind of like I should kind of like protect myself and be less sensitive um, to the pain of other bodies. Like a, um, I live in there, and and it's it's, it's kind of an uncomfortable. Um, but it's, it's my nature, so it's like, ah, you know, <laughs> so like trying to find that piece of equanimity of, of, of being able to receive, uh, hear, know, but not react and not kind of not feel to the level I feel um, the pain of other people. So I don't know if you have anything to say about that. I'll just say something briefly, Michelle, because you you just answered your question again. Uh, equanimity is a feeling. It's just a feeling, an emotion of evenness, rather than reactivity. And and yes, because you're sensitive, and we often feel others other people's feelings or pain often when they don't feel it themselves. And it can, it, we can be flooded or overwhelmed. And so equanimity is, is probably the emotion uh, to, to see if we can call up or abide in that then is a protection, is itself a boundary, a protection. It's not cutting us off from other people. It's just that the, that emotion is, is st st stable, stabilizing. It's like the heart just evens out for a while. It's not trembling with the pain and that we feel when we feel compassion for others hurt, or it's not kind of flooding with, a, with appreciative joy when we're happy for other people's happiness, when we feel joy for other people's happiness. It, it's just level. And, and actually, many people who are going through a hard time, they're, they're looking for that kind of stability. So just by you having it affects them, whether they know it or not, they may, they may just settle in a little bit, even if they're feeling a lot of suffering emotions or they're going kind of they're flooding with maybe exuberance you know filled with a, a kind of joy that's so strong they become attached to it and so your presence of of even mindedness yeah. is easing balancing. It helps yourself, it helps those around you who you are affected by from your sensitivity. So look more for that beautiful emotion called equanimity. And in a way to arrive to that place is kind of connected more with the body, with the breath, with being grounded. I think it, it's already there. It's it's already oh. in our heart. It's so it's maybe just being stilled, as Michelle says, when awareness and wisdom merge to become a wisdom awareness. You you go to the heart and you just maybe go through the different Brahma Viharas as you know them. You know, f friendliness or kindness, the care of compassion, the, the appreciative joy, and then the emotion that balances all of those, which is equanimity, stabilizes and balances the other Brahma Viharas. So we have it just taking moments, breathing in for a while, maybe some reflection 
on upeka, the word for equanimous abiding, and then seeing if you can feel it. And, and yes, you'll feel it in the body, you'll feel it in the heart, you'll feel it as a real supreme emotion. One of the, um, just that that's all like perfect instruction with this. So I, I think um, I wanted to just add in that there really are different types of humans. And if you are more of the open sensitive type, then um, the difficulty is the aversion to the pain. So it's it's like the the vulnerability itself, the openness. It's like a if you take the metaphor of a, a flower bud, and then an open flower. The open flower doesn't get to choose what it's open to. It just opens to pleasure, pain, neutral. It's it's like and um, some humans have um, less protection, yeah. They're just, and that often the protection that people are who are not as sensitive, it's more of a fake equanimity, but it works. It's a great defense. <laughs> and so that, op that open, if you're real open, it's a karma. It's not like um, you're gonna wake up tomorrow and say, okay, I'm just gonna be a flower bud and that's that, I'm gonna be, that closed type, you know, it's, it's, it's all of our different karma. It all comes out in the wash eventually anyway. But if you are that type, it's usually helpful to remember that if you're having a hard time, it, it's usually because it hurts so much. The pain part of it will hurt so much. And you're not really getting that it's time to take a time out. You need more time out. You need more pleasure, more time out to like let that intensity of pain, let it wash through. So everything Steve's saying is what you need to do. I'm just trying to explain why it's hard because it's like it hurts so much you, you think it shouldn't hurt that much or you want to be like other people who are not walking around like that, right? Yeah. So, but if you look at it technically, it's because there's, there's aversion to the pain. And then there's aversion to the aversion to the pain, right? And it's more of a, just like it, it gets, um, you know, again, everything Steve's saying, like being able to have your awareness open up and care about your pain, even if you've been with someone else who's in pain, it, it's not their pain or your pain. It's just pain and that ability to have the observing of it and to not take it personally and to have caring about it and ultimately the equanimity for it. Yeah, the, all that's what to do, but it's also remembering that um, it's very motivating to be that type. Very motivating. Because you have two choices. <laughs> to hide in a room with four walls so that you're not feeling everything without any, any, anything on or to like gradually develop the skills Steve is saying so that you can deal with the openness to the pain. The openness to the neutral, the openness to the joy, it's not that hard, frankly. But, you know, and everyone, ha you know, whether some people are like gradually opening or they're kind of open. It doesn't matter. We're all developing the qualities at the same time, but that open type does need more, more protection physically, meaning you get away from, get away from humans for a while. Does this make sense? It's very important. Yeah, very much. Yes. Yeah. 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 You might need much. to get away yeah. more than more than other people and that's okay and they might yeah. never understand you but that's okay yeah 
And for me, it's going to nature. It really heals me. Like in, I can breathe if I am, right. you know, walking, talking, walking with the trees. And, right. All yeah. that is yeah. to help balance you. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all awesome. those Brahma Viharas are essential for that. The, the wisdom, not all the Brahma Viharas penetrating that openness of heart is the practice. Yeah. And then when you can't do it, you, you hide. <laughs> hide. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's true. So we're going to have a, a full eclipse as well as an election on the same day. <laughs> so there's the paradox of life right there, that range of experience that we're able to meet. We'll pick up the pieces next Sunday. as best we can, all of us, yeah. We can do this, we can get through another election. <laughs> and for those in Canada, I hope you're enjoying being in Canada or Japan. <laughs> yeah. Lots of Brahma Viharas, lots of wisdom. <laughs> 